Tonight, we're going to uh, address why so many walls are characterized by sexual violence, overwhelmingly against women, even in this modern era. Is it something to do with the culture of the combatants? Is it a consequence of having large numbers of armed young men with seemingly unfettered power over civilians, including women? Or is it something else entirely about the nature of war? So the aim tonight is to shine some light on the question, why? Um, now, we're lucky tonight to have some of the world's leading experts on this topic, uh, Jackie, Sarah, and Joanna, leaders and inaugural members of the Center of Excellence um, based here in Melbourne, which hopefully we'll hear more about later. But first, I want to talk about conflicts that have not been characterized by widespread sexual violence. From my own experience, uh, Northern Ireland, the Falklands War, the Dofar War. Is there anything we can learn from where social, uh, sexual violence was not noticeably widespread to help understand the reasons for it where it is widespread? And I'm wondering, Sarah, whether we might start with you. Thank you so much, Richard. And I would also like to acknowledge the lands on which I am coming to you from today of the Turrbal and Jagera people. Uh, and I really appreciate the invitation to speak tonight. So your question, I think, is one that has really captured a lot of attention in the last 10 years, where there's been excellent researchers such as Elizabeth Wood who've tried to understand or identify locations where reports of perpetrators committing this violence um, have been lower for some than for others or locations where the violence hasn't tended to be reported in great numbers. And a lot of that research has been focused more on historical events uh, and some recent contemporary events. I suppose for me there's two things to think about when trying to understand this very important question of where situations exist where the occurrence is perhaps lower compared to others or where perpetrators is lower is that first of all we need to think about what are we talking about here when we use the word widespread? So we need to be really careful when we're thinking about situations where we're not seeing evidence of reports coming through. Is that because there is not, there are no reports or there are no occurrences or is it because we're thinking about widespread in terms of a number? So we have all in our minds a threshold and we know over the last 10 to 12 years that the United Nations Office for Sexual Violence has has tried to discourage this idea of having a number because numbers may not always indicate the actual prevalence of what's going on in terms of particular populations being targeted. Um, and I'll come back to that point later. So first of all, widespread is not a number and widespread actually the absence of rep reports can sometimes be an indication of in that particular conflict that you might have a criminal system that's failing to investigate or you might have a military system that is actually under-reporting or under-documenting conflict-related sexual violence. Um, so we need to, first of all, be really conscious of the fact that the absence of reports may, may not indicate the absence of its occurrence. Um, but I also think, too, your question also requires us to think about sexual violence and what we define it as here. So in some of the conflicts that you referred to there, we may have been talking about maybe looking for the common indicator of the common crime, which is rape. But again, what we've started to think about in the last 10 to 20 years, courtesy in particular of the importance of the adoption of the Rome Statute, uh, which informs the work of the International Criminal Court, is that rape, can, sexual violence can include actually a, a broad number of, of gender-based violent crimes. And so actually, when we now look back at some conflicts, we may see that there has been presence of sexual and gender-based violence from strip searches to forced marriages that could have been occurring actually at the onset of conflict uh, as part of enforcing dominance over populations, driving populations to flee. 
And then perhaps the conflict conditions change and then you don't necessarily see those crimes committed during the, the height of violence, but then in post-violence that, that violence can re-emerge. So we've started to look more at a broader definition of sexual violence and also started to realise too that conflict has phases where this violence can be intense and where it can decline. And then my final point would be um, the strategic use. So you may see a war where it's not strategically used, but that doesn't mean that it's not present. Um, and, and this is also another area that we're looking into a lot more. Some people call it expressive or opportunistic. Jackie's fantastic work has talked a lot about it as a continuum. And what this means is that we need to be really thinking about the fact that the gendered violence can, can be present uh, and it can have these sorts of degrees of acceptance um, and that can also lead to situations where what we see, what we think is not there is actually there, but it's just coming across and emerging in different patterns. Uh, and I'll turn over now to Jackie because I imagine she has something to say about this as well. Uh, uh, thanks so much, Sarah. It's really fun to do this hybrid event with you, even though you're coming to Melbourne tomorrow night. Um, look, I mean, I think it's a really important question, Richard. Thank you so much. Like looking at situations where there doesn't appear to be sexual violence in the context of war and conflict and what we can learn from that. Um, I think the question alone suggests that it's not inevitable, the use of sexual violence and conflict. We don't need these types of crimes um, in the context of war, especially given the evolution of international law. Sarah mentioned the Rome Statute. Um, that we can now prosecute um, sexual violence as a war crime, as a crime against humanity, and as a crime of genocide. But at the same time, I think we need to ask, how do we know that sexual violence has not been used, perpetrated, for example? You, you mentioned your own experience, um, and lived experience, of course, is um, taken very seriously in research these days. But... Um, you know, many experiences of victimization of sexual violence are never reported, okay? There's a pervasive silence about this type of crime. And that's because this type of violence and the reason why it's often uh, utilized strategically and opportunistically is because it's used to shame and stigmatize particular individuals and groups so that they don't report it, so that they get the clear message that they need, you know, that they need to leave, uh, they need to survive, um, they need to shut up. Um, and so I think when we look at previous cases, we actually have to have that curiosity. What actually happened there? Um, was there sexual violence? What type? Um, in what context? Rather than say, oh, it didn't happen because it's not happening like it's happening in the Ukraine, in Ukraine, for yeah. example. So, you know, you mentioned Northern Ireland, um, and I currently have a fabulous PhD student, Gabrielle Williams. I doubt she's online because she's a cabinet minister in the Victorian government, but she is studying Northern Ireland and speaking to a lot of women, uh, you know, in, in, in that area. Um, and I think we can say that there were types of sexual violence in Northern Ireland, and we can go right back to the... Um, you know, the Civil War in the 1920s and historians are documenting actual acts of sexual violence by the British Army at the time. There was no, there was impunity. There was no prosecution. There was no reports. So, you know, I think maybe we need to dispel the notion that there's one type of sexual violence and one type of event and that's kind of a mass rape where you have whole platoon of soldiers go out and prosecute, you know, the same type of violence and start to understand well, what are the different types of sexual violence, as Sarah said, and what phase of conflict are they used, um, by whom um, and, and, and why? I guess the why question is still important. So maybe just pushing back a little, and we've pushed back in the scholarship on this a bit too, um, particularly in the case of Sri Lanka. A lot of people think that rebel groups like the Tamil Tigers didn't use sexual violence. But it depends on how you define sexual violence and remember that sexual violence within the armed group is hardly ever reported because the loyalty has to be to your group, especially if you're in an ethno-nationalist conflict, right? Who are you even going to report the violence to? What's the cost of reporting that violence? Um, and there's an ideology about a greater, greater, greater goal and greater mission. So 
Can we talk about um, the mix of masculinity and power? Um, most fighters in war, not all, but most fighters in war are young males. Um, and much warfare does seem to involve some transference of power from traditional authority figures to young men and teenage boys armed with guns. Uh, young men and teenage boys with sexual appetites in an environment in which they are, for the first time in their young lives, empowered to take almost anything they want. Are these important factors in understanding much of the violence against women in war? Are they masculinity and power so wrapped up in each other that they're impossible to distinguish from each other? Mm -hmm. Do you want to answer that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I'll, I'll turn to the others. Yeah. Um, look, it's a it's a great question and it's important. And maybe just to start with masculinity and note that, um, you know, I mean, these kind of acts of violence um, are acts of domination. And they can be perpetrated by diverse individuals, not solely men, um, but predominantly men, as you point out. Um, but we do have cases of where women are also perpetrators. They might not be perpetrating, for example, if it's rape, the rape itself, but they may be, you know, preparing the victim, you know, involved and, in, you know, uh, you know, part of, of the act. So that's important. And that has been in the case of Rwanda and the Rwandan genocide. Um, that, that, and Sierra Leone as well, that's been documented, right, and investigated um, and, and, and prosecuted. Um, so I think it's, and, and, I, and I would generally take the view that, um, you know, which is a feminist view of war. War is socialization into masculinity in the extremes. So part of the socia socialization to be able to, you know, to, to normalize the use of violence against an enemy um, is, you know, there are various methods to, to make individuals and, and mostly individual men who are recruited into armies comfortable with that. And one of, one of the methods is to, you know, encourage them to, uh, to normalise the use of, 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 of sexual violence or of violence uh, against women. And the fact that militaries historically have institutionalised prostitution, um, sex work around military bases shows you that this is part and parcel um, of the conduct of war, right? And even like agreements are made about these things to sort of legalise certain kind of sexual arrangements. But I think that the research on the use of sexual violence shows that it's not this kind of inherent thing to young men with their sexual appetites, but it rather relates to... Um, the kind of uh, the kind of training in the military, the way in which people are recruited into militaries, are they recruited through abduction in a forced way, um, and therefore, you know, acts of sexual violence are used to kind of you know into inculcate them into the group, the brothers in arms, and so forth. Um, so some of these institutional factors are really significant, rather than any kind of inherent biological factors. And here I would just point to the current war in Ukraine. So currently, I mean, we can see this pattern, right? We've got like a situation where Russia is down on its numbers for recruits, okay? They're losing them fast and furious. Um, and they are actually going out to Russian men and saying, if you're a real man, you need to join the army. You can't be, you know, and they literally... I mean, Australia has ads to join the army too, and they're, they're quite different than that. But if you're you're a taxi driver or a gym instructor, you know, you need to man up and join the army. And remember, there's also, you know, that's crucial for, for them in terms of their effort to win that war, right? And then there's like, what do you get for that? What are the gains? What are the rewards? And what often happens is the armies allow as Sarah mentioned, a certain opportunistic, a certain opportunity for soldiers to uh, engage in these gang rapes or um, attacks against civilians where they can also, uh, you know, 
uh, you know, and often under the, the use of alcohol and drugs as well. So that some of this kind of culture of hyper-masculinity, extreme masculinity, is actually part of the um, the socialization and, and the pitch to men to join the army. And we've had that, like, even in the Australian Defence Forces, we have this problem, right? Who joins? Who wants to join the military? What image do we have of soldier and of war? And sometimes we end up recruiting people who desire to have to, to dominate, right? And to to carry out whatever type of violence, you know, you know, they like in, you know, in the bat on the battlefield. And that's a war crime, and we are taking that seriously. But um, but I think there's a you know there's a range of things here that we need to consider, um, and definitely um, war does provide opportunities for domination and power over civilians, especially civil war. I'll 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 ask Sarah for a comment in a second, but can I just ask a quick comeback on uh, your analysis of what's happening in the current Russia-Ukraine war? Um, because President Zelensky has described uh, this, the, the mass rape of Ukrainian women by Russian soldiers as a weapon of war against the people of Ukraine. Do you think he's actually right, or is it more to do, as you say, about the socialization of the Russian? Well, I, I don't think those things are contradictory. Of course, um, he's using that as part of his narrative, but um, we know that the Office for the High Commissioner of Human Rights already um, uh, received reports and produced a report last October, um, which documented, I think, something like 15 sexual violence crimes, a number of rapes. They're not just of women. They also include of children, um, of men and boys. So I think that's really important to note that the, often the stigma and the shame of rape of men and boys is uh, also actually has an impact on the group. Um, and also, obviously, the strategic goals of the, the Russian army to move people off territory. Um, but there, I think, I, I think that, you know, there, there is a targeting of civilians and there is a particular targeting. Uh, still, I would say, I think in, in the cases that we've seen, they say it's up to 80 percent would be women and women and children um, in terms of the sexual violence crimes that have been reported and investigated to date. And of course, as Sarah mentions, like looking forward, like we will have many more reports once that, once that war's over. So we don't really understand the pattern yet. We can't really know. Um, but definitely the intent of those crimes has been, uh, has been a weapon of war, right? Of course, it's about Russian control of that territory and, you know, removing civilians from that territory and terrifying civilians and terrifying the Ukrainian people. So, um, but there are also crimes against individuals and there are individual victims and there has to be justice for those individual victims. Thank you. Now, Joan, I'm going to come to you in the next question, but I just want to, first of all, uh, pass, uh, but Sarah, do you want to add anything else about that issue of masculinity and power? Or did you pray that much? Thank you. I mean, I think what I would do is just compliment what Jackie said is that one of the debates that has been really strong over the last decade or so has been about if we say that sexual and gender-based violence and conflict situations are about gendered norms, um, then we're having to take on, you know, a really vast amount of social change, right, in order to try and start to reduce the occurrence. But I actually think what recent research is starting to demonstrate, of which, you know, I'm really delighted that we're all part of, is that actually it's male dominant gender roles in society. So that can lead to situations where, as Jackie was saying, that you can have women perpetrating these crimes, you can have men committing these crimes against boys and men. Um, and it's, it's about identifying the fact that it is the gender dominance norms and societies that can really give rise to 
populations being targeted for perpetrators identifying who they will target and thinking about who they're going to commit attacks and why those attacks are effective in terms of producing stigma, shame, uh, as well as populations fleeing. Um, and so it's starting to, if you like, start to expand what we see as strategic uh, and, and, and starting to think about, in the case of conflict-related sexual violence, um, strategy needs to be widened now to think about the way in which gendered norms are part of the strategic fight in a war. You know, it's about who survives, um, who is allowed to flourish at the end and who is not, who can safely return and who cannot. You know, so it's it's very much connected to conquering territory um, and being able to decide what the population will look like after conflict. And so it's, I would argue, the sex, you know, the young men, the sex is not necessarily, that's powerful, right, because of how they've been taught to think about their, their dominance and what role they have in creating, you know, society and deciding who will be part of their society. Which really leads us really nicely into uh, our next question, um, which is about culture. Um, and this one's looking at you to start off with, Joanna. Um, whether some cultures are more prone to sexual high levels of sexual violence in war, or whether in some cultures um, are sufficiently strong to inhibit um, that kind of behaviour, even in wartime, where in war many taboos are lifted from normal civilian life. You know, the taboo against killing, which is possibly the greatest taboo on all in, in the human race, is lifted in wartime. So it's not surprising that other taboos are also lifted. Um, so how important do you think is culture to in the prevalence of sexual violence against women? And are there examples which indicate, indicate that some cultures more prone than others or not? Um, and if we can, um, perhaps we can leave religion to a, the next question, um, if we can separate culture and religion. Do you, do you want to start off with, with that one? Right. Okay. I mean, I think to look at the issue of culture in conflict, we have to look at the issue of culture before conflict. What was the culture of the community before culture, before conflict with, with regards to um, sexual violence? Was the community, how did it define sexual violence? What was the community's perception of sexual violence? How did it, what was the stigma? What was the, the, um, the this acceptance or otherwise of sexual violence by the community before there was conflict? Was there a voice for the victim or survivor within the social fabric of the community when it comes to sexual violence? How did the family, how did the community, how did the social embodiment of the community accept, provide a system that would seek redress for a survivor of sexual violence? So for example, in communities that um, had child marriage, how did they address child marriage in that community? In some communities, they will tell you that once a child had its, um, a, a, a female child, um, reach puberty and had her first period, she's considered an adult. So in that sense, she could get married. That was before conflict. After conflict or during conflict, that notion doesn't change. So when conflict arises, that child can still get married. So it, it doesn't, it's when a child is married off during conflict at the age of 10, because she had a period, it's not because of the conflict. It's because of the culture of the society. So people would, and then when the conflict erupts, and then the UN storms the community and then says there's sexual violence and the community goes, no, there isn't, it's child marriage, it's marriage. And then we start documenting the figures and says that there is sexual violence in the community. And the community goes, no, it's not, it's marriage. We've been having this marriage for hundred years. And now you are now telling us that this is, this is violence. And there was a clash between the community and the international community that's, that is now the savior of them. There is a problem because they have had this system in place for centuries and it has worked for them. And you are now telling them that this is violence. And that is where the issues now begin. So the culture of it, the community has been looked at in the beginning before we start giving definitions of what violence is. 
what has been the system of the community before the court, before the violence erupted, before whatever has happened and happened. And I think that is what one of the things that in, in, in the scholarship, in the literature, we have at times missed the discussion. In the humanitarian activities that we have done, we have not really paid attention to what was there before and what happened during the conflict. Was it because of the conflict or was it really the system that, that was there? We have communities where a female cannot leave home without a male guardian. It wasn't because of the conflict. It has always been the system in place. The conflict is only now putting light on what has been existing for hundreds of years. And we are now telling the community that it's a problem. How we, how, and we go in and, and, and tell them that it's a problem because it's a conflict, because of the conflict. No, it's not. It has been a system that has been there for centuries. And we are now coming to, in our, in our definition, enlighten them. But we have to let this, this, the community understand the problem and begin to get them to understand where the problem is and how do we change it without being the savior by having an understanding of a conversation and dialogue where the problem is. There is a conflict in many communities between the issue of the age of consent to have sex and the age of child marriage. In many countries, even developed countries, the age of consent of a child, of a girl to have sex, it's most of the time is different for the age of child marriage. Some children can, have, can give consent to have sex at 16, but the age of marriage is different. And that is a problem. And immediately there's a conflict and everybody knows about it. It's, it's the sexual violence. So I think we have a, a, a bit of a dichotomy between where is, the conf where is the culture before conflict and what happens when conflict becomes a problem. That is the first problem that we have. Then there's an the issue of what is the justice system that was in place before the conflict happened? Was there enough systems in place to actually address the problem? The people have confidence in the systems that the, the institutions that were in, in, in country to allow them to seek redress within their own societies. It could be the traditional system of it could be the traditional system, or it could be the legal systems where their confidence in it. Again, going back to the voice of the victim to be able to seek redress. Was there enough support in the social fabric for them to be able to say, I have been victimized, I can seek redress? If that wasn't there, and then the conflict happens, it's it's, it's and I think Jackie and Sarah already said it, it's a free for all. Once the taboo is broken, and already before the, before the conflict, there wasn't much of a system. Once the conflict has happened, it's a free-for-all for everyone to now be, in quotes, misbehave. Then we have the issue of, um, back to the issue of the male guardianship. When you have a, we have a male guardian, females don't have autonomy over their own sexuality. It falls under the autonomy of their male guardian or their father. When you become of age, it's shifted to somebody else, the husband. So that independence is no longer there. And once there's a conflict or there is chaos or there is war, and many a times, take for example, Boko Haram, you know, when they initially began their insurgency, they would kill off the men. So that protectiveness that the men gave to the females was no longer there. And they, they, they now took over to provide the protectiveness and that protection that was needed. And most often, and I think that's what Professor True and I mean, Sarah, Professor Davis have talked about, is the fact that it's about dominance. It's about inciting, in, inciting fear. It's about ensuring that they are emasculated in the patriarchal system where women are seen to be under the protection of men. They rape, they, 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 rape, they violate to emasculate the men, to bring about humiliation. So when initially, the system operated in a way that it's seen as is a man's world. The men provided protection. The men ensured that the women were safe. The men ensured that the women had everything they needed. Once the men were not there or they were under the dominance of this new force, women were now used as a tool to ensure that the men knew that they were no longer in a position of power and that this new force had the power to do it. So it's just a matter of we shifting the, the role of culture and ensuring that you no longer had authority. And we now dominated your women and ensured you, know, you don't have you no longer have that protection over them. And we are now the ones who provide that protection over them. And I think you asked the question about the armed groups. And I think um Jackie and Sarah have spoken a lot about the militarization of the, the, the camps and the, the militarization of sex and then providing 
the sex comes around the armed forces and show that there was always women available for them. The issue of um, national, national security rape and where the states felt as if women were a threat to them. And so they use rape and, and uh, sexual violence as a way to um, humiliate women and to discredit them and to ensure that they weren't a force. Or they use systematic rape to alienate an ethnic group and alienate a, a group of women or use them to try and ensure that these women um, became, for lack of a better word, unwilling cocoons to be um, bring forth the next generation of purer breeds of women or of children that will now be the force to ensure that a, a, a cleaner or a purer breed of children will now be used. So I think for us to be able to have a better conversation of culture and how it's a society will be able to understand sexual violence, we always have to go back to what was there before. That's very interesting. Jackie, go ahead. Anything to add to that? No, I think that's just fascinating what jo Joanna said. And I, I mean, I don't really like the term culture because I think when, uh, especially Westerners use culture, it's kind of this homogenous kind of fixed thing instead of a dynamic, changing struggle for power, right? It's a site of hegemony. And so, but what, what's really key is that gender relations, as Joanna's described it, like in, which would include how marriage, <laughs> conjugal relations are organised, uh, how the group is reproduced over time, that's a site of power. And so when, um, you know, with, you know, it could be with regard to child marriage, but also with regard to sexual violence, uh, this is why this is used. This is so crucial for taking power and sustaining power over a group. Um, and it's not, you know, we shouldn't view it as just a men versus women in that kind of a binary type, uh, you know, narrative because um, it actually you know, it, it's, you know, everyone has a stake in gender relations. Everyone has some kind of gender identity. Um, as Osama bin Laden said, the worst thing for a, a man is to be raped. treated like a woman and to be raped. And they, you know, like he was mm. really using this. This is why, you know, um, you know, pointing to at that time the, the, the American rape of uh, men in prisons, um, in Iraq was so salient as a strategy, right? Um, and so it becomes this currency of war. And, and I think that, you know, unfortunately what you referred to before, the, the statement by Zelensky, which in, you know, it is correct, Russia is using sexual violence against civilians as a weapon of war, but it's also becoming so politicized that it becomes part of the battleground, right? And that's a concern if there's impunity um, for those crimes, because um, you know we are actually also part of fueling this type of violence. Um, and also to mention to Joanna, I mean, I think we have to understand that our understanding of violence is also evolving over time. What we consider to be violence is really context specific. Um. Can we move on to religion? Um, religion famously has been the cause, of course, of many wars through history. Rather less famously, um, it's also been the means by which wars have often been averted or ended. Now, one of the most egregious recent uses of religion, um, promoting violence against women, uh, is, of course, by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Um, now, I think actually that Joanna has gone a long way to already answering my question on this, because in the Muslim Arab countries or societies in which I've lived, um, women are respected and protected. Um, too much in normal the Western view, but nevertheless protected. So, you know, how do we square this, on the face of it, extraordinary dichotomy between the protection of women on one hand and extreme violence against women in the name of religion on the other? Who wants to answer that one? 
I think the issue of religion, and I'll start it off with, um, I think I, I mentioned earlier on the issue of um, the male guardian, and then the, um, we had a conversation last week about um, Afghanistan and the, the return of the Taliban and the role of the Taliban systematically now beginning to reintroduce forms of um, slowly reintroducing guardianship again and women not being able to move without um, a male guardian. And, it, and this can actually be your four-year-old son because you may not have a husband or an older child or an older per male to be in charge of you. So it can be your four-year-old son or your four-year-old male, whoever in the house, who now has a squad 50-year-old woman to out of the house because she needs a male person to be her guardian. And so we had a conversation about this and how this five-year-old boy may, may now be the person who now has to be this guardian. And if the, it's now becoming such that if the males don't ensure this, they are the ones who will be held accountable for, for this. Not, no more the female, but now the male. So this five-year-old boy is now being held accountable if the woman leaves the, the house without a guardian. And gradually he is being indoctrinated to become or being conditioned that it is his role to ensure she complies. So in the next 10 years, 15 years, he feels it is his job for her to, to, to obey. And that is how slowly he's becoming indoctrinated. And now without him even realizing it, he feels it is his duty as a man to be in charge. And this is how slowly religion is being, and they will find Quran, they will find verses in the Quran to support this kind of behavior. And I, and I think all religions, whether you like it or not, and I'm, I'm not Muslim, so I can't, I can't quote any Quran to, to support this, but I'm a Christian. And there are people in my, in my faith who will say that as a woman, as a married woman, it is my role to submit to my husband as the head of the household. And um, there are people who will say that as the, as the head of the household, if there's a decision to be made in my house and we can't agree on one, he as a head has to make the final decision whether I agree with it or not. So, and, and I can quote Ephesians in different parts of Ephesians to support this. So religion over the years have been used in many ways to submit, to, to get women to, to succumb to whatever it is that um, we, for lack of a better word, it's supposed to be. And I think another group that I can also speak about is Boko Haram. And I think there's another question about that, but Boko, yeah. We probably won't have a time for another question. So please talk to us about Boko Haram. So Boko Haram. And, 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 and does the male guardianship issue there also hold good? So Boko Haram never used the issue of male guardianship in, in any, any way or form. Boko Haram mostly focused on um, ensuring that women were used for, um, for lack of a better word, um, four main things as wives. To, to breed, sorry, that's a wrong verb to use, I'm sorry. Women to, to produce the next generation of um, um, persons um, who will consider the jihad. Um, women to be as in, uh, wives as incentives for the men that they were recruiting into the fold. Women to be as um, negotiating pawns with the, the governments to release um, um, persons that they had um, um, arrested. Women to be used as, um, as suicide bombers and also women who would take care of the domestic needs of the, of the campsites. But I, I, religion for Boko Haram, and as I, I continue to try to understand them, was more a tool for recruitment than it was a tool of um, ideology. It was, it was, Boko Haram was created or was formed in Northeastern Nigeria at a time when Sharia law was being adopted as a criminal law by most of the, the 12 states in, no, in the northeastern part of Nigeria. So almost all the states there were beginning. Nigeria is a federal state and it allows its individual states to adopt laws peculiar to themselves. So all the states within those regions were beginning to adopt um, Sharia law, which had hitherto had Sharia law, but was more of a private entity. At that, but at that some point, those states began to have Sharia law as a criminal law, and those regions began to operate Sharia law. And Boko Haram at that point decided, came out in 2002 to advocate for Sharia law to become a purer version of the law to be applied 
And when it started in 2002, it, it, it didn't come out as a terrorist group. It was more of a, a group that was advocating for purity of the Islam. For, um, it actually was quite friendly towards women. It, um, when you see form Boko Haram in 2002, women were allowed in the mosque. He actually advocated for women to marry within, the, 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 within themselves. He advocated for cheaper marriage because it was quite expensive to marry at that time. He advocated for women to be able to, when the diaries were paid, instead of being paid to the father and then the family, was actually being paid to the women themselves, so able to use it to trade among themselves. He was advocating for loans within themselves. So it was actually seen as a social group that um, worked within themselves and evolved. But by 2009, the state started to clamp down on it because it was also advocating for a state within the state. And the state felt as a threat. So in 2009, the state started fighting Boko Haram. And it actually, in June, July 2009, it killed Usif within, that was the leader of Boko Haram. It killed it, it, him whilst in detention. And it's, the group went underground. And the next leader that came became radicalized. And he became more extreme. And that was when, by 2013, the state declared Boko Haram as a terrorist group. And then it went... Yeah, and still because it found itself within an Islamic community, religion became the tool within which it used to recruit because it was, it was formed on religion or was formed within an Islamic group, an Islamic community, and they formed themselves based on that. But I don't, I stand to be corrected, but I don't think religion was the ideology within which Bukharam, it solely was a tool that it used in recruiting. And many other people who joined I think that's the key thing. Yeah. The, the religion is a tool. Yeah. Therefore, it's about politics yeah. in the end. And it's just, I mean, I would say it's the same point that I have about culture, that religion itself is contested. And most people that um, in working on um, violent extremism and terrorist conflict um, and the gender dynamics of that, most people would argue that ISIS affiliate groups um, have a very limited understanding of um, Islamic teachings uh, and texts. So um, that, they're, that, that they have an ideological reading, which is a political ideological reading. Um, and so I think that that's important for us because we can acknowledge that you could be a very religious person um, and, and definitely not, um, you know, subscribing to or supporting jihad yeah. in this way. Um, and I think it's particularly important because many women are religious. Women's political participation worldwide, like if we were to, if we include their participation in public religions, that is the dominant form of their participation. Women are the ones who volunteer in churches and mosques and temples um, they do a lot of the labor that sustains religions. Um, they identify with the moral mission of religions. And in our research, when we've asked these questions of women and men about, you know, why they, for example, might support um, an extremist or violent group, it's because of the kind of moral mission, especially for women. So I think um, we kind of need to unpack that. But I think, you know, one thing I'd like to say is that if we look back on ISIS, I think, um, and, and this is something I've said about um, Islamist terrorist groups in particular, is that they understand gender yeah. and how to manipulate yeah. it better than we do. They understand that gender relations are crucial to control and maintain and reproduce group identities and territory yeah. okay and they figure out how to recruit people into their group based on their current grievances in terms of people's current ability to be able to reproduce themselves and their families um and you know and their livelihoods so there's a political economy um to uh you know to 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 religion um, and and to the uh, and to and to violent uh, groups as well, and that's appealing to men, and women within existing gendered orders, which are hierarchical. I mean, what I found really interesting uh, this evening, and we'll move on very quickly to our last question. But how really interesting is that the whole issue of sexual violence in war is about power, and more importantly, about a transference of power which is what war is all about. Um, and so it's, there is something that is actually uh, at the core of that, which I find absolutely fascinating. 
Now, um, the Center of Excellence for the Elimination uh, uh, of Violence Against Women. Is elimination possible? Um, or is that the wrong question? Sarah, do you want to answer? I thought Jackie was going to take that one, but I think it's appropriate perhaps she has the last word. <laughs> um, I think I think we have to think about elimination because it is possible in the sense that we are able to, as you said at the beginning, Richard, we are building towards societies where we're starting to think about prohibitions, right, unconscionable acts of violence that we as a society say we don't tolerate that and, and, and there's judgment and there's consequence, societal as well as material for people who engage in that violence. And I think that's why for us as our project, it's very important when we're talking about sexual violence and conflict to talk about the gendered norms and the dominance of gendered norms that permits this violence. Because as you said, it's about chain, it's about identifying it is an act of power, you know, and that it is about trying to claim power and, it's, and, and withhold it from others. It's incentivized. And, and so I think when we start to identify the drivers and the enablers, then we can start to have a conversation about the norms that need to change, the inclusion of you know, sexual violence and ceasefire agreements. We don't trade crimes of sexual violence away at that point. We have very clear understandings about who should be sold arms and who should be trained in alignment with our militaries. And we make sure that we are thinking really carefully about the partners and the armed groups and states that we are going to support and we're going to work with because we're promoting that sexual violence and trying to prevent it is possible. And there are steps that you can take as a military organization, as an armed organization, and as a society to reduce its occurrence. Sarah, thank you. The last word. Oh my goodness. Tracking. Should we have a last word each, Joanna and I? Okay. Elimination Two, is it possible? A minute each. <laughs> It's possible. I think with the right policies, with the right um, with the right policies, with the right sensitization, with the right initiatives put in place, we are. It's, it's possible to eliminate it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and and maybe to add to Sarah, I think um, in the in the discussion we've had also about culture and religion, it's looking for those sources, those narratives, those teachings um, within our cultures and religions that uh, embrace nonviolence and embrace norms of equality uh, and of humanity. And I think every religion has norms that, that can bring us to a place where this type of violence is no more. Jackie, Sarah, Joanna, thank you so much. It's been absolutely fantastic. Please uh, uh, join me in thanking our speakers. Uh, any any questions? We've got a roving microphone to come around in the room, or we can go to Zoom. So just stick your hand up, and we'll bring it. Or um, thank you very much for sharing your amazing knowledge. My name is Yolanda Vega. My question is: Can you quantify? We know that in a non in in Australia, for example, one in three women are raped and more experience violence against women. I'm just curious as to what the numbers tell us between what's happening in a non-war environment compared to a war environment, considering we've spoken about how culture and religion take part in that male brainwashing, if you like. So what can we quantify? Thank you for that question. It's a really important one and it's one that there's been a lot of discussion. So one of the largest data sets that have been created to try and look at reports of sexual violence across primarily civil conflicts from 1989 to 2019 have identified that around perhaps two thirds of those conflicts have had reports of sexual violence. Now, what starts to happen at that point though, so it's two thirds of all of all conflicts, 
Um, but then what they do is they start to make a distinction there between incidents so that were sort of um, what we were talking about before, perhaps opportunistic versus ones, and then ones that started to increase more in intensity, and then ones that would be identified as meeting the conditions of genocide or ethnic cleansing. And so what you have then is trying to understand, for example, in the case of 2017 uh, in, in Myanmar, where you had uh, you know, now very reliable reports of the scale and intensity of attacks that were occurring against the Rohingya in that effort to try and expel them um, from Rakhine State. The, the the likelihood there is that you were dealing with, you know, possibly between 80 to 90 percent. You know, it was really, really high. Um, but that's in the same conflict in that same year where there were also incidents of violence um, against uh, populations in, in Shan and Kachin and Karen states as well. And the incidents there weren't as high. So one of the things that we're trying to work out is, you know, is how do you explain that variation in the same conflict and, and what's happening in that instance and, and, um, and what can be done in a situation there where you have a state that is permitting it uh, and if some and and definitely under documenting it, and and failing to to investigate and prosecute. Maybe I can just add something to your question, Yolanda. Um, um, just really with regard to what I think Sarah mentioned earlier about the continuum of violence, and so one of the continuums is talking about violence um, in the pre-conflict period that Joanna talked about in so-called peacetime and during conflict and and after. Um, and I think just generally to say that um, we would say that societies with high levels of gender inequality and norms that uh, support gender discrimination and inequality are much more likely uh, to engage in systematic sexual and gender-based violence. So there's a continuum there um, between societies which normalise this type of violence, which means that the violence will largely not be reported or counted. Mm. So the data we have in Australia, which I think is, you know, roughly one in three women will experience some type of sexual or gender-based violence in their lifetime. Well, you know, that there might be a certain robustness around that, but that is not the case in every society. And, in fact, the societies where gendered violence is normalised there's very poor reporting and recording of that. So I think the quantification is not the primary strategy in order to understand uh, violence. And then uh, just, just to say, after conflict, what we are finding, there's quite a, more and more research showing this. Most recently, I saw this with regard to Angola, mm -hmm. looking at those soldiers who were engaged in uh, you know, the use of sexual violence during the conflict, also going back to the areas where they demobilise high levels of intimate partner violence, domestic violence in those areas. That's also been shown for Colombia. So we're starting, you know, it's quite difficult to do that kind of quantitative research where you, because you have to have to, you know, you have to have the reported data during the conflict, which is very difficult. And then you have to have the census surveys after the conflict you know, which is geocoded or by area. But we see now, we, we can say that demobilised soldiers who participated in, in uh, you know, gender violence during war are also much more likely to perpetrate um, violence uh, after war. You know, there's a kind of a decentralization of violence. The violence and the weapons often go home. Um, so that's an important continuum. But for Australia, it's also really relevant for us in all of our communities where we have high levels of violence. Uh, this violence that will not, you know, it's not just contained to the home. Like it will be violence that will seep into other spaces. So I, I, ne I don't actually like this term domestic violence because it gives us the idea that somehow the violence can kind of be domesticated when it never can. Thank you for this amazing discussion tonight. Uh, Federica Caso here. Uh, I've got a question about whether there is any knowledge or evidence um, about whether the inclusion of women in defense and the use of gender military advisors is uh, helping with uh, eradicating gender-based violence in conflict. Thank you. Well, 
So there has been support of researchers say that including women in the in the armed forces and the presence of women in armed forces in peace support operations supports or helps when it comes to um, issues of gender-based violence. So for example, if, and that's one of the issues that we've people have had when in criticizing, for example, counter um, counterterrorism or counterinsurgency strategies, where as Jackie said earlier on, terrorists understand the gender nature of communities. So they've utilized it quite effectively. But when we send out the troops, it's mainly male dominated. And then you go in and we have all these women and children, but we have a lot of men going in to do the rescuing. And then there's a bit of a backlash. So having the presence of females has been quite effective in that sense. But also more importantly, having women on the, at the planning stage and having a different voice and having a more diverse voice at the table to do the planning and the logistical implementation of these things have been quite effective. But as to whether or not having um, women in the troop, as part of the troops themselves have changed the mentality of the troops themselves, um, it's, I, I was part of a research which is um, being sponsored by Canada, the ELSA initiative that has been looking at women's participation in peace support operations. And it has been asking women about whether their presence in the armed forces has changed the perception of men and how they view um, sexual gender based violence, both within the country and also externally. And I think the conversation that we've had is, goes back to what, what pertains in the country. What is the notion of sexual and gender based violence within the community as a country? Because the armed forces are also a reflection of the country as a whole. So that, that perception also translates into the armed forces. And so there has to be also a change within the country itself before we can have a change within the armed forces. But I think generally speaking, having presence of women within the force itself kind of makes you want to, and the continuous um, conversation, both by the, by the leadership wanting to do better and changing the policies and having better um, deterrence in place compels persons within the force to want to do change um, attitude, no, not change, change behavior. Changing attitude takes longer. So those are two different things. Changing behavior is one. Changing attitude is a different thing. So you may act better, but what you think inside is a different thing altogether. So yes, it's, it's changing behavior. As to whether or not it's changing how the person thinks, that I, it's difficult for me to say. But at least the presence there, the changing of policies, the ad adapting of gender policies, the adapting of the sea and all other things by the UN and also member states and triple three countries has made the forces be more vigilant, has made them more accountable to both, to both themselves and the personnel they have within the, their forces, and has made them be a bit more accountable, to, yes, and has also made the advisors sit on them and ask them to, to, to do what, it, what they have signed on to do. And it's bringing about a bit more change. As to whether or not the thinking has changed, I, with, with time, I, I, I think that there has been change. And then to take thinking attitude takes time. Behavior, you can modify. And I think with time, we have seen progress within the forces as, 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 as they progress, yes. Uh, Sarah, do you want to add anything else to, to that? In that case, I think we'll say thank you so much uh, to our panelists. It's been a really fascinating session. I've learned an enormous amount. Um, and I think we're finishing just about on time. So thank you. <laughs>